It was a beautiful morning on the island of Sodor. Thomas the tank engine's blue paint sparkled in the sunshine as he puffed happily along his branch line with Annie and Clarabelle. He was feeling very pleased with himself. Hello, Thomas, whistled Percy. You look splendid. Yes, indeed, boasted Thomas. Blue is the only proper color for an engine. Oh, I don't know. I like my brown paint, said Toby. I've always been green. I wouldn't want to be any other color either, added Percy. Well, well, anyway, huffed Thomas. Blue is the only color for a really useful engine. Everyone knows that. Percy said no more. He just grinned at Toby. Later, Thomas was resting when Percy arrived. A large hopper was loading his freight cars full of coal. Thomas was still being cheeky. Careful, he warned. Watch out with those silly cars. Go on, go on, muttered the cars. And by the way, went on Thomas, those buffers don't look very safe to me. The last load poured down. Help, help, cried Thomas. Get me out. Percy was worried, but he couldn't help laughing. Thomas's smart blue paint was covered in coal dust from smoke box to bunker. Ha ha, chuckled Percy. You don't look really useful now, Thomas. You look really disgraceful. I'm not disgraceful, choked Thomas. You did that on purpose. Get me out. It took so long to clean Thomas that he wasn't in time for his next train. Toby had to take Annie and Clarabelle. Poor Thomas, whispered Annie to Clarabelle. They were most upset. Thomas was grumpy in the shed that night. Toby thought it a great joke, but Percy was cross with Thomas for thinking he had made his paint dirty on purpose. Fancy a really useful blue engine like Thomas becoming a disgrace to Sir Topham Hatt's Railway. Next day, Thomas was feeling more cheerful as he watched Percy bring his cars from the junction. The cars were heavy and Percy was tired. Have a drink, said his driver. Then you'll feel better. The water column stood at the end of the siding with the unsafe buffers. Suddenly, Percy found that he couldn't stop. The buffers didn't stop him either. Oh, wailed Percy. Help! The buffers were broken, and Percy was wheel deep in coal. It was time for Thomas to leave. He had seen everything. Now Percy has learned his lesson, too, he chuckled to himself. That night, the two engines made up their quarrel. I didn't cause your accident on purpose, Thomas, whispered Percy. You do know that, don't you? Of course, replied Thomas, and I'm sorry I teased you. Your green paint looks splendid again, too. In future, we'll both be more careful of coal.
Edward was getting old. His bearings were worn and he clanked as he puffed along. He was taking empty cattle cars to a market town. The sun shone, birds sang. But Edward was heading for trouble. Come on, come on, he puffed. Oh, oh, screamed the cars. Edward puffed and clanked. The cars rattled and screamed. Some cows were grazing nearby. They were not used to trains. The noise and smoke disturbed them. As Edward clanked by, they broke through the fence and ran across the line. A coupling was broken and some cars were left behind. Edward felt a jerk, but didn't take much notice. He was used to cattle cars. Bother those cars, he thought. Why can't they come quietly? He was at the next station before either he or his driver realized what had happened. When Gordon and Henry heard about the accident, they laughed and boasted. Fancy allowing cows to break your train. They wouldn't dare do that to us. We'd show them. Old Toby was cross. You couldn't help it, Edward. They've never met cows. I have, and I know the trouble they are. Some days later, Gordon rushed through Edward's station. Boop, boop! Mind the cows! Hurry, hurry, puffed Gordon. Don't make such a fuss! Don't make such a fuss, grumbled his coaches. A long stretch of line lay ahead. In the distance was a bridge. It seemed to Gordon that there was something on the bridge. His driver thought so, too. Whoa, Gordon, he said, and shut off steam. Whew, said Gordon. It's only a cow. Shoo! Shoo! He moved slowly onto the bridge, but the cow wouldn't shoo. She had lost her calf and felt lonely. She said sadly. Everyone tried to send her away, but she wouldn't go. Henry arrived. What's this? A cow? I'll soon settle her. Be off! Be off! Henry backed away nervously. I don't want to hurt her. At the next station, Henry's conductor told them about the cow and warned the signalman that the line was blocked. That must be Bluebell, said the porter. Her calf is here, looking for her mother. Percy will take her along. At the bridge, Bluebell was very pleased to see her calf again, and the porter led them away. Not a word. Keep it secret, whispered Gordon and Henry to each other. They felt rather silly, but the story soon spread. Well, 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 chuckled Edward. Two big engines, afraid of a cow. Afraid? Rubbish, said Gordon. We didn't want the poor thing to hurt herself by running up against us. We stopped so as not to excite her. You see what I mean, my dear Edward? Yes, Gordon, said Edward. Gordon felt somehow that Edward saw only too well.
One morning, Edward was waiting to pick up passengers from Thomas's train. Beep, beep. We're late. Where is Thomas? He doesn't usually make us wait. Oh, dear, what can the matter be? sang the fireman. Johnny's so long and... Never you mind about Johnny, laughed the driver. Just you climb on the cab and look for Thomas. Can you see him? No, replied the fireman. There's Bertie Buss in a tearing hurry. No need to bother with him, though. Likely he's on a coach tour or something. He clambered down. Stop! Stop! I've got Thomas's passengers, wailed Bertie, roaring up to the gates. It was no good. Edward was gone. Bother, said Bertie. Bother Thomas's fireman not coming to work today. Why did I promise to help the passengers catch the train? That will do, Bertie, said his driver. A promise is a promise, and we must keep it. Catch Edward or bust, said Bertie. Oh, my gears and axles, he groaned, toiling up the hill. I'll never be the same bus again. Hooray, hooray, I see him, cheered Bertie as he reached the top. Oh, no, Edward's at the station. No, he stopped at a crossing. Hooray, hooray. Bertie tore down the hill. Well done, Bertie, shouted his passengers. Go it. Bertie skidded into the yard. Wait, wait, cried Bertie. He was just in time to see Edward puff away. I'm sorry, said Bertie. Never mind, said the passengers. After him quickly. Third time lucky, you know. Do you think we'll catch him at the next station, driver? There's a good chance, replied the driver. Our road keeps close to the line, and we can climb hills better than Edward. I'll just make sure. He spoke to the station master. Bertie and the passengers waited impatiently. Yes, we'll do it this time, said the driver. Hooray, called the passengers as Bertie chased after Edward once more. This hill is too steep, this hill is too steep, grumbled the coaches as Edward snorted in front. They reached the top at last and ran smoothly into the station. Beep, whistled Edward. Get in quickly, please. The conductor blew the whistle and Edward's driver looked back, but the flag didn't wave. Then he heard Bertie. Everything seemed to happen at once, and the station master told the conductor and driver what had happened. I'm sorry about the chase, Bertie, said Edward. My fault, replied Bertie. Late at junction, you didn't know about Thomas's passengers? Beep, beep. Goodbye, Bertie. We're off, whistled Edward. Three cheers for Bertie, called the passengers. Bertie raced back to tell Thomas that all was well. Thank you, Bertie, for keeping your promise, said Thomas. You're a very good friend indeed.
Sir Topham Hatt works his engines hard, but they are very proud when he calls them really useful. I'm going to the scrapyard today, Edward called to Thomas. What, already? You're not that old, replied Thomas cheekily. Thomas was only teasing. The scrapyard is full of rusty old parts and machinery. They're broken into pieces, loaded into cars, and Edward pulls them to the steelworks where they are melted down and used again. Today, there was a surprise waiting for Edward in the yard. It was a traction engine. Hello, said Edward. You're not broken and rusty. What are you doing here? I'm Trevor. They're going to break me up next week. What a shame, said Edward. My driver says I only need some paint, polish, and oil to be as good as new. But my owner says I'm old-fashioned. Edward snorted. People say I'm old-fashioned, but I don't care. Sir Topham Hatt says I'm a useful engine. What work did you do? My owner would send us from farm to farm. We threshed corn, hauled logs, and did lots of other work. The children loved to see us. Trevor shut his eyes, remembering. Oh, yes, I like children. Edward set off for the station. Broken up, what a shame. Broken up, what a shame. I must help Trevor. I must. He thought of all his friends who liked engines, but strangely, none of them would have room for a traction engine at home. It's a shame, it's a shame, he hissed. Then, beep, beep, why didn't I think of him before? There on the platform was the very person. Hello, Edward, you look upset. What's the matter, Charlie? He asked the driver. There's a traction engine in the scrapyard, Vicar. He'll be broken up next week. Jem Cole says he never drove a better engine. Do save him, sir. He saws wood and gives children rides. We'll see, replied the Vicar. Jem Cole came on Saturday. The Reverend is coming to see you, Trevor. Maybe he'll buy you. Do you think he will? Asked Trevor. He will when I've lit your fire and cleaned you up. The vicar and his two boys arrived that evening. Trevor hadn't felt so happy for months. He chuffered about the yard. Show your paces, Trevor, said the vicar. Later, he came out of the office smiling. I've got him cheap, Jem, cheap. Do you hear that, Trevor? Cried Jem. The Reverend saved you, and you live at the vicarage now. Beep, beep, whistled Trevor. Now Trevor's home is in the vicarage orchard, and he sees Edward every day. His paint is spotless, and his brass shines like gold. Trevor likes his work, but his happiest day is the church fair. With a wooden seat bolted to his bunker, he chuffers round the orchard, giving rides to children. Long afterward, you'll see him shut his eyes, remembering. I like children, he whispers happily. One day, James had to wait at the station till Edward and his train came in. This made him cross. Late again! 
Edward laughed and James fumed away. After James had finished his work, he went back to the yard and puffed onto the turntable. He was still feeling very bad tempered. Edward is impossible, he grumbled to the others. He clanks about like a lot of old iron, and he is so slow, he makes us wait. Thomas and Percy were indignant. Old iron? Slow? Why, Edward could beat you in a race any day. Really, said James. I should like to see him do it. Next morning, James's driver was suddenly taken ill. He could hardly stand. So the fireman uncoupled James ready for shunting. James was impatient. Suddenly, the signalman shouted. There was James puffing away down the line. All traffic halted, called the signalman. Then he told the fireman what had happened. Two boys were on James's footplate fiddling with the controls. Whew. They tumbled off and ran when James started. The signalman answered the telephone. Yes? He's here. Right. I'll tell him. The inspector's coming at once. He wants a shunter's pole and a coil of wire rope. What for? wondered the fireman. Search me, but you'd better get them quickly. The fireman was ready when Edward arrived. The inspector saw the pole and the rope. Good man, jump in. We'll catch him, we'll catch him, puffed Edward. James was laughing. What a lark, what a lark, he chuckled to himself. Suddenly, he was going faster and faster. He realized that he had no driver. What shall I do? I can't stop. Help! Help! We're coming! We're coming! called Edward. Edward was panting up behind with every ounce of steam he had. At last, he caught up with James. Steady, Edward, called his driver. The inspector stood on Edward's front, holding a noose of rope in the crook of the shunter's pole. He was trying to slip it over James's buffer. The engines swayed and lurched. At last, got him, he shouted. He pulled the noose tight. Gently braking, Edward's driver checked the engine speed and James's fireman scrambled across and took control. So, the old iron caught you after all, chuckled Edward. I'm sorry, whispered James. Thank you for saving me. You were splendid, Edward. That's all right, replied Edward. The engines arrived at the station side by side. Sir Topham Hatt was waiting. A fine piece of work, he said. James, you can rest and then take your train. I'm proud of you, Edward. You shall go to the works and have your worn parts mended. Oh, thank you, sir, said Edward. It'll be lovely not to clank. Trevor, the traction engine, enjoyed living in the vicarage orchard. Edward came to see him every day, but sometimes Trevor didn't have enough work to do. 
I do like to keep busy all the time, he sighed one day. And I do like company, especially children's company. Cheer up, smiled Edward. Sir Topham Hatt has work for you at his new harbor. I'm to take you to meet Thomas today. Oh, exclaimed Trevor happily. A harbor, the seaside, children, that will be lovely. Thomas was on his way to the harbor with a trainload of metal pilings. They were needed to make the harbor wall firm and safe. Hello, Thomas, said Edward. This is Trevor, a friend of mine. He's a traction engine. Thomas eyed the newcomer doubtfully. A what engine? A traction engine, explained Trevor. I run on roads instead of rails. Can you take me to the harbor, please? Sir Topham Hatt has a job for me. Yes, of course, replied Thomas, but he was still puzzled. Workmen coupled Trevor's car to Thomas's train and soon they were ready to start their journey. I'm glad Sir Topham Hatt needs me, called Trevor. I don't have enough to do sometimes, you know, although I can work anywhere. In orchards, on farms, in scrapyards, even at harbors. But you don't run on rails, puffed Thomas. I'm a traction engine. I don't need rails to be useful, replied Trevor. You wait and see. When they reached the harbor, they found everything in confusion. Cars had been derailed, blocking the line, and stone slabs lay everywhere. We must get these pilings passed, said Thomas's driver. They are essential. Trevor, we need you to drag them round this mess. Just the sort of job I like, replied Trevor. Now you'll see, Thomas. I'll soon show you what traction engines can do. Trevor was as good as his word. He dragged the pilings clear with chains and towed them into position. Who needs rails, he muttered cheerfully to himself. Later, Thomas brought Annie and Clarabelle to visit him. Thomas was most impressed. Now I understand how useful a traction engine can be. The coaches were full of children. Trevor gave them rides along the harbor. He liked this best of all. He's very kind, said Annie. He reminds me of Thomas, added Clarabelle. Everyone was sorry when it was time for Trevor to go. Thomas pulled him to the junction. A small tear came into Trevor's eye. Thomas pretended not to see. He whistled gaily to make Trevor happy. I'll come and see you if I can, he promised. The vicar will look after you, and there's plenty of work for you now at the orchard, but we may need you again at the harbor someday. That would be wonderful, said Trevor. That evening, Trevor stood remembering his new friend Thomas, the harbor, and most of all, the children. Then he went happily to sleep in the shed at the bottom of the orchard. Percy works in the yard at the big station. He 
He loves playing jokes, but they can get him into trouble. One morning, he was very cheeky indeed. Beep, beep! Hurry up, Gordon. The train's ready. Gordon thought he was late. Ha, 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 ha! Laughed Percy and showed him a train of dirty coal cars. Gordon thought how to get back at Percy for teasing him. Next, it was James's turn. Stay in the shed today, James. Sir Topham Hatt will come and see you. Ah, thought James. Sir Topham Hatt knows I'm a fine engine. He wants me to pull a special train. James's driver and fireman could not make him move. The other engines grumbled dreadfully. They had to do James's work as well as their own. At last, the inspector arrived. Show a wheel, James. You can't stay here all day. Sir Topham Hatt told me to stay here. He sent a message this morning. He did not. How could he? He's away for a week. Oh, said James. Oh, where's Percy? Percy had wisely disappeared. When Sir Topham Hatt came back, he was cross with James and Percy for causing so much trouble. But the very next day, Percy was still being cheeky. I say, you engines, I'm to take some freight cars to Thomas's junction. Sir Topham Hatt chose me especially. He must know I'm a really useful engine. More likely he wants you out of the way, grunted James. Gordon looked across to James. They were going to play a trick on Percy. James and I were just speaking about signals at the junction. We can't be too careful about signals, but then I needn't say that to a really useful engine like you, Percy. Percy felt flattered. We had spoken of backing signals, put in James. They need extra special care, you know. Would you like me to explain? No, thank you, James, said Percy. I know all about signals. Percy was a little worried. I wonder what backing signals are, he thought. Never mind, I'll manage. He puffed crossly to his freight cars and felt better. He came to a signal. Bother! It's a danger. The signal moved to show line clear. Its arm moved up instead of down. Percy had never seen that sort of signal before. Down means go, and up means stop. So upper still must mean go back. I know, it's one of those backing signals. Come on, Percy, said his driver. Off we go. Stop, you're going the wrong way. But it's a backing signal, Percy protested and told him about Gordon and James. The driver laughed and explained. Oh dear, said Percy. Let's start quickly before they see us. He was too late. Gordon saw everything. That night, the big engines talked about signals. They thought the subject was funny. Percy thought they were being very silly. Do you know what? asked Percy. What? grunted Gordon. Do you know what? 
Silly, said Gordon. Of course I don't know what. If you don't tell me what what is. Sir Topham Hatt says that the work in the yard is too heavy for me. He's getting a bigger engine to help me. Rubbish, said James. Any engine could do it. If you worked more and chattered less, this yard would be a sweeter, a better, and a happier place. Percy went off to fetch some coaches. That stupid old signal, he thought. He was remembering the time he'd misunderstood a signal and gone backwards instead of forwards. No one listens to me now. They think I'm a silly little engine and order me about. I'll show them. I'll show them. But he didn't know how. By the end of the afternoon, he felt tired and unhappy. He brought some coaches to the station. Hello, Percy, said Sir Topham Hatt. You look tired. Yes, sir. I am, sir. I don't know if I'm standing on my dome or on my wheels. You look the right way up to me, laughed Sir Topham Hatt. Cheer up. The new engine is bigger than you and can probably do the work alone. Would you like to help build my new harbor? Thomas and Toby will help too. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The new engine arrived. What's your name? asked Sir Topham Hatt. Montague, sir, but I'm usually called Duck. They say I waddle. I don't really, sir, but I like Duck better than Montague. Good. Duck it shall be. Here, Percy, show Duck around. The two engines went off together. Soon they were very busy. James, Gordon, and Henry watched Duck quietly doing his work. He seems a simple sort of engine. We'll have some fun and order him about. Quack, 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 whish! Smoke billowed everywhere. Percy was cross, but Duck took no notice. They'll get tired of it soon. Do they tell you to do things, Percy? Yes, they do, answered Percy. Right, said Duck. We'll soon stop that nonsense. He whispered something. We'll do it later. Sir Topham Hatt was looking forward to hot buttered toast for tea at home. Suddenly he heard an extraordinary noise. Whee! Bother, he said, and hurried to the yard. Duck and Percy calmly sat on the switches outside the shed, refusing to let the engines in. Gordon, James, and Henry were furious. Stop that noise, bellowed Sir Topham Hatt. They won't let us in, hissed Gordon. Duck, explain this behavior. Beg pardon, sir, but I'm a great western engine. We do our work without fuss. But begging your pardon, sir, Percy and I would be glad if you would inform these uh, engines that we only take orders from you. Silence! said Sir Topham Hatt. Percy and Duck, I am pleased with your work today, but not with your behavior tonight. You have caused a disturbance. Gordon, Henry, and James sniggered. As for you, thundered Sir Topham Hatt, You've been worse. You made the disturbance. Duck is quite right. This is my railway, and I give the orders. After Percy went away, Duck was left to manage alone. He did so easily. Percy worked hard at the new harbor. The workmen needed stone for their building. Toby helped, but sometimes the loads of stone were too heavy, and Percy had to fetch them for himself. 
Sometimes he'd see Thomas. Well done, Percy. Sir Topham Hatt is very pleased with us. An airfield was close by. Percy heard the airplanes zooming overhead all day. The noisiest of all was a helicopter. Silly thing, said Percy. Why can't it go and buzz somewhere else? One day, Percy stopped at the airfield. Hello, said Percy. Who are you? I'm Harold. Who are you? I'm Percy. What whirly great arms you've got. They're nice arms, said Harold. I can hover like a bird. Don't you wish you could hover? Certainly not. I like my rails, thank you. I think railways are slow, said Harold. They're not much use and quite out of date. He whirled his arms and buzzed away. Percy found Toby at the quarry. I say, Toby, that Harold, that stuck-up whirlybird thing, says I'm slow and out of date. Just let him wait. I'll show him. He collected his freight cars and started off still fuming. Soon they heard a familiar buzzing. Percy, whispered his driver. There's Harold. He's not far ahead. Let's race him. Yes, let's, said Percy. Percy pounded along. The car screamed and swayed. Well, I'll be a ding dong dang, said the driver. There was Harold. The race was on. Go it, Percy, he yelled. You're gaining. Percy had never been allowed to run fast before. He was having the time of his life. Hurry, 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 he panted to the cars. We don't want to, we don't want to, they grumbled. It was no use. Percy was bucketing along with flying wheels and Harold was high and alongside. The fireman shoveled for dear life. Well done, Percy, shouted the driver. We're gaining. We're going ahead. Oh, good boy, good boy. A distant signal warned them that the harbor wharf was near. Beep, beep, beep. Brakes, conductor, please. The driver carefully checked the train's headlong speed. They rolled under the main line and halted on the wharf. Oh dear, groaned Percy. I'm sure we've lost. The fireman scrambled to the cab roof. We've won, we've won, he shouted. Harold's still hovering. He's looking for a place to land. Listen, boys, the fireman called. Here's a song for Percy. Said Harold the helicopter to our Percy, you are slow. Your railway is out of date and not much use you know. But Percy and his stone cars did the trip in record time. And we beat the helicopter on our old branch line. Percy loved it. Oh, thank you, he said. He liked the last line best of all and was a very happy engine. The island of Sodor is very busy. Holiday makers love to sightsee, and when the weather is fine, there is no better place to visit. Some people like to go to the mountains, 
Others like the valleys. Children love the seaside. One morning, Thomas was puffing along the line that runs by the coast. His two coaches, Annie and Clarabelle, were packed with children going to the beach. Everyone was happy. Percy was taking some freight cars to the harbor. Hello, Thomas. You look cheerful. I wish I could take children today instead of freight cars. They're the Vicar's Sunday School, explained Thomas. I'm busy this evening, but the station master says I can ask you to take the children home. Of course I will, promised Percy. Later, Percy saw Harold. Sorry, Percy. Can't talk. I'm on high alert. Why? Bad weather's due. My help's always needed. Mind how you go, Percy. Huh, <laughs> huffed Percy. As long as I've got rails to run on, I can go anywhere, in any weather, anyhow. Goodbye. Be careful, warned Edward. There's a storm coming. A promise is a promise, thought Percy, no matter what the weather. The children had a lovely day, but by tea time, dark clouds loomed ahead. Annie and Clarabelle were glad when Percy arrived. He was just in time. The rain streamed down Percy's boiler. Ugh, he shivered and thought of his nice dry shed. Percy struggled on past coastal villages and into the countryside. The river was rising fast. I wish I could see, I wish I could see, complained Percy as he battled against the rain. More trouble lay ahead. hissed Percy. The water is sloshing my fire. Percy's driver and fireman had to find some more firewood. I'll have some of your floorboards, please, said the fireman to the conductor. I only swept the floor this morning, grumbled the conductor, but he still helped. Soon Percy's fire was burning well. He felt warm and comfortable again. Then he saw Harold. Oh dear, thought Percy. Harold's come to laugh at me. Something thudded onto Percy's boiler. Ow! exclaimed Percy. He needn't throw things. It's a parachute, laughed his driver. Harold's dropping hot drinks for us. Thank you, Harold, whistled Percy. Good to be of service, replied Harold and buzzed away. Water lapped Percy's wheels. Percy was losing steam again, but he plunged bravely on. I promised, he panted. I promised. He made one more big effort, and at last, exhausted but triumphant, he brought the train home. Well done, Percy, cheered Thomas. You kept your promise, despite everything. Sir Topham had arrived in Harold. First he thanked the men, then Percy. Harold told me you were a, a wizard. He said he can beat you at some things, but not at being a submarine. I don't know what you two get up to sometimes, but I do know that you're a really useful engine. Oh, sir, whispered Percy happily. Thomas the tank engine was ill. Workmen had tried to make him better, but it was no use. Edward must take you to the works, said Sir Topham Hatt. 
Thomas felt very miserable. Then Sir Topham Hatt spoke to Duck. I want you to help Percy and Toby while Thomas is away. Duck was delighted. He already knew Percy and soon made friends with Toby and Bertie. Terence the tractor gave him a big welcome too. Take care of Thomas's coaches, he advised. He's sure to miss them while he's away. Duck was very gentle with the coaches. Annie and Clarabelle were impressed. Such nice manners, they told each other. It really is a pleasure to go out with him. When Thomas came back, Annie and Clarabelle told him how well Duck had managed. Thomas was so pleased to be home that he soon forgot to be jealous. The works had left Thomas's handbrake very stiff. It made his brakes seem as if they were on, when in fact they were not. As a result, he and his coaches often overran the platform. Thomas found this most embarrassing. Gradually, his driver and fireman learned to be extra careful. But one day, Thomas's fireman was ill, and a relief man took his place. The fireman had fastened the coupling and joined the driver and station master on the platform to wait for Henry's passengers. The fireman had forgotten all about Thomas's handbrake. Thomas simmered happily. Not long now, he thought, as he saw Henry slowly approaching. But Thomas's brakes were not on. And suddenly, he felt his wheels begin to move. He tried to stop, but he couldn't, without his driver and fireman. He tried to whistle a warning, but he couldn't do that either. The conductor, driver, fireman, and passengers were all stranded on the platform. Stop! Stop! shrieked Annie and Clarabelle. But Thomas, with plenty of steam, kept on going. The alarm went down the line. Stop the runaway! There, ready for action, was Harold the helicopter. The inspector had made a plan, and together they took off into the sky. At last, Thomas was tiring. I need to stop! I need to stop! He panted wearily. As they neared the next station, Thomas saw Harold land. They entered the platform slowly enough for the inspector to act. Judging his moment, the inspector scrambled into the cab and screwed the brakes on. At last, Thomas stopped. Both he and the inspector were very relieved. Then they thanked Harold. Think nothing of it. Glad to be of service, any time. Thomas, remarked the inspector, we must never let this happen again. Wearily, Thomas agreed with him. One day, Henry wanted to rest, but Percy was talking to some engines. He was telling them about the time he had braved bad weather to help Thomas. 
It was raining hard. Water swirled under my boiler. I couldn't see where I was going, but I struggled on. Oh, Percy, you are brave! Well, it wasn't anything, really. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Tell us more, Percy. What are you engines doing here? hissed Henry. This shed is for Sir Topham Hatt's engines. Go away. Silly things, Henry snorted. They're not silly. Percy had been enjoying himself. They are silly, and so are you. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Huh. Anyway, said Cheeky Percy, I'm not afraid of water. I like it. He ran off to the harbor singing. Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. No one ever lets me forget the time I wouldn't come out of the tunnel in case the rain spoiled my paint, huffed Henry. Thomas was looking at the board on the key. Danger. We mustn't go past it, he said. That's orders. Why? Danger means falling down something, said Thomas. I went past danger once and fell down a mine. I can't see a mine, said Percy. He didn't know that the foundations of the key had sunk. The rails now sloped downward to the sea. Stupid board, said Percy. He made a plan. One day, he whispered to the cars, will you give me a bump when we get to the key? The cars had never been asked to bump an engine before. They giggled and chattered about it. Driver doesn't know my plan, chuckled Percy. On, 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 laughed the cars. Percy thought they were helping. I'll pretend to stop at the station, but the cars will push me past the board. Then I'll make them stop. I can do that whenever I like. Every wise engine knows you cannot trust freight cars. Go on, go on, they yelled and bumped Percy's driver and fireman off the footplate. Ow, said Percy, sliding past the board. Percy was frantic. That's enough! Percy was sunk. You are a very disobedient engine. Percy knew that voice. Please, sir, get me out, sir. I'm truly sorry, sir. No, Percy, we cannot do that till high tide. I hope it will teach you to take care of yourself. Yes, sir. It was dark when they brought floating cranes to rescue Percy. He was too cold and stiff to move by himself. Next day, he was sent to the works on Henry's freight train. Well, 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 chuckled Henry. Did you like the water? No. I am surprised. You need more determination, Percy. Water's nothing to an engine with determination, you know. Perhaps you will like it better next time. Percy is quite determined that there won't be a next time. Duck is very proud of being Great Western. He talks endlessly about it, but he works hard too and makes everything go like clockwork. It was a splendid day. The 
cars and coaches behaved well. The passengers even stopped grumbling. But the engines didn't like having to bustle about. There are two ways of doing things, Duck told them. The Great Western way or the wrong way. I'm Great Western and... Don't we know it, they groaned. The engines were glad when a visitor came. He purred smoothly towards them. So Topham had introduced him. Here is Diesel. I have agreed to give him a trial. He needs to learn. Please teach him, Duck. Good morning, purred Diesel in an oily voice. Pleased to meet you, Duck. Is that James and Henry and Gordon too? I am delighted to meet such famous engines. The silly engines were flattered. He has very good manners, they murmured. We're pleased to have him in our yard. Duck had his doubts. Come on, he said. Diesel purred after him. Your worthy top, Sir Topham Hat to you, ordered Duck. Diesel looked hurt. Your worthy Sir Topham Hat thinks I need to learn. He is mistaken. We Diesels don't need to learn. We know everything. We come to a yard and improve it. We are revolutionary. Oh, said Duck. If you're rev a rev, rev a thing of me, perhaps you would collect my cars while I fetch Gordon's coaches. Diesel, delighted to show off, purred away. When Duck returned, Diesel was trying to take some cars from a siding. They were old and empty. They'd not been touched for a long time. Diesel found them hard to move. Pull! Push! Backwards! Forwards! Oh! Oh! The cars groaned. We can't! We won't! Duck watched with interest. Diesel lost patience. He roared and gave a great heave. The cars jerked forward. Oh! They screamed. We can't! We won't! Some of their brakes snapped and the gear jammed in the sleepers. Ha ha ha! Chuckled Duck. Diesel recovered and tried to push the cars back, but they wouldn't move. Duck ran quietly round to collect the other cars. Thank you for arranging these, Diesel. I must go now. Don't you want this lot? No, thank you. Diesel gulped. And I've taken all this trouble? Why didn't you tell me? You never asked me. Besides, said Duck, you were having such fun being re-whatever it was you said. Goodbye. <laughs> Diesel had to help the workmen clear the mess. He hated it. All the cars were laughing and singing at him. Cars are waiting in the yard, tackling them with easel. Show the world what I can do, gaily boast the diesel. In and out he creeps about, like a big black weasel. When he pulls the wrong cars out, pop goes the diesel. <laughs> Growled diesel, and scuttled away to sulk in the shed. Diesel, the new engine, was sulking. The freight cars would not stop singing rudely at him. Duck was horrified. Shut up, he ordered, and bumped them hard. I'm sorry our cars were rude to you, Diesel. Diesel was still furious. 
It's all your fault. You made them laugh at me. Nonsense, said Henry. Doc would never do that. We engines have our differences, but we never talk about them to the cars. That would be dis... dis... Disgraceful, said Gordon. Disgusting, put in James. Despicable, finished Henry. Diesel hated Duck. He wanted him to be sent away, so he made a plan. He was going to tell lies about Duck. Next day, he spoke to the cars. I see you like jokes. You made a good joke about me yesterday. I laughed and laughed. Duck told me one about Gordon. I'll whisper it. Don't tell Gordon I told you. And he sniggered away. Ha, 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 guffawed the cars. Gordon will be cross with Duck when he knows. Let's tell him and get back at Duck for bumping us. They laughed rudely at the engines as they went by. Soon Gordon, Henry, and James found out why. Disgraceful, said Gordon. Disgusting, put in James. Despicable, finished Henry. We cannot allow it. They consulted together. Yes, they said. He did it to us, we'll do it to him and see how he likes it. Duck was tired out. The cars had been cheeky and troublesome. Wanted to rest in the shed. The three engines barred his way. Keep out. Stop fooling, said Duck. I'm tired. So are we, hissed the engines. We are tired of you. We like Diesel. We don't like you. You tell tales about us to the cars. I don't. You do. I don't. You do. Sir Topham Hatt came to stop the noise. Duck called me a galloping sausage, spluttered Gordon. Rusty red scrap iron, hissed James. I'm old square wheels, fumed Henry. Well, Duck? Duck considered. I only wish, sir, he said gravely, that I'd thought of those names myself. If the dome fits. <coughs> he made cars laugh at us, accused the engines. Sir Topham Hatt recovered. He'd been trying not to laugh himself. Did you, Duck? Certainly not, sir. No steam engine would be as mean as that. Diesel lurked up. Now, Diesel, you heard what Duck said. I can't understand it, sir. To think that Duck, of all engines, I'm dreadfully grieved, sir, but no, nothing. I see, said Sir Topham Hatt. Diesel squirmed and hoped he didn't. I'm sorry, Duck, but you must go to Edward's station for a while. I know he will be glad to see you. As you wish, sir. Duck trundled sadly away, while Diesel smirked with triumph. Duck, the great western engine, puffed sadly to Edward's station. It's not fair, he complained. Diesel has been telling lies about me and made Sir Topham Hatt and all the engines think I'm horrid. Edward smiled. I know you aren't, 
and so does Sir Topham Hatt. You wait and see. Why don't you help me with these cars? Duck felt happier with Edward and set to work at once. The cars were silly, heavy, and noisy. The two engines had to work hard, pushing and pulling all afternoon. At last, they reached the top of the hill. Goodbye, whistled Duck, and rolled gently over the crossing to the other line. Duck loved coasting down the hill, running easily with the wind whistling past. Suddenly, it was a conductor's warning whistle. Hurrah! 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 laughed the cars. We've broken away! We've broken away! Chase him! Bump him! Throw him off the rails! they yelled. Hurry, Duck, hurry, said the driver. They raced through Edward Station, but the cars were catching up. As fast as we can, then they'll catch us gradually. The driver was gaining control. Another clear mile and we'll do it. Oh, glory! Look at that! James was just pulling out on their line from the station ahead. Any minute, there could be a crash. It's up to you now, Duck, cried the driver. Duck put every ounce of weight and steam against the cars. It's too late, Duck groaned. He veered into a siding where a barber had set up shop. He was shaving a customer. The silly cars had knocked their conductor off his van and left him far behind after he had whistled the warning. But the cars didn't care. They were feeling very pleased with themselves. Beg pardon, sir, gasped Duck. Excuse my intrusion. No, I won't, said the barber. You've frightened my customers. I'll teach you. And he lathered Duck's face all over. Poor Duck. Thomas was helping to pull the cars away when Sir Topham had arrived. I do not like engines popping through my walls, fumed the barber. I appreciate your feelings, said Sir Topham Hatt, but you must know that this engine and his crew have prevented a serious accident. It was a very close shave. Oh, said the barber. Oh, oh, excuse me. He filled a basin of water to wash Duck's face. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were being a brave engine. That's all right, sir. I didn't know that either. You were very brave indeed, said Sir Topham Hatt. I'm proud of you. Sir Topham Hatt watched the rescue operation. Then he had more news for Duck. And when you are properly washed and mended, you are coming home. Home, sir? Do you mean the yard? Of course. But, sir, they don't like me. They like Diesel. Not now. I never believed Diesel, so I sent him packing. The engines are sorry and want you back. A few days later, when he came home, there was a really rousing welcome for Duck, the Great Western Engine. Engines were finding life difficult. Workmen were mending the viaduct on the main line. The arches needed strengthening. Sir Topham Hatt did not want to close the railway while the work was done, and so repairs took a long time. The 
The engines had to take great care when crossing the viaduct, and the delay often made them late on their journey to the junction, where they knew Thomas would be ready to collect his passengers. Thomas grew crosser and crosser. Time's time, he grumbled. Why should I keep my passengers waiting while Henry and James dawdle about all day on viaducts? Don't blame me, snorted Henry. If we hurried across the viaduct, it might collapse, and then you'd have no passengers at all. What would you do then? Run my train on time, for one thing, retorted Thomas. He hurried away before Henry could answer. Bertie was impatient too. He was timed to arrive just after Thomas. His passengers found that instead of going straight from the bus to their train, they were kept waiting till Thomas arrived. Soon Bertie grew cross with Thomas. Late again, he remarked, as Thomas panted wearily in. We may be friends, but I thought you could go fast, Thomas. It's time we had another race. I reckon I could beat you now. Thomas let off steam loudly. Rubbish, he hissed fiercely. It's those main line engines. They dither about on the viaduct, and they blame Sir Topham Hatt's workmen. It's just an excuse for laziness, if you ask me. One day, James was later than ever at the junction. I'm sorry, Thomas, he puffed. I was held up at the station, and the viaduct made it worse. It's lucky for you I'm a guaranteed connection, grumbled Thomas. Before James could answer, he puffed importantly away. Come along, come along, he panted to the coaches. Annie and Clarabel did their best, but Thomas soon found that he couldn't save much time. Suddenly, Thomas saw Bertie ahead. His radiator was steaming. What's the matter, asked Thomas. You should be at the station by now. You're late. I feel dreadful, moaned Bertie, all upset inside, and driver says he can't make me better. Thank goodness you're late, too. Can you take my passengers, please? They'll never get home otherwise. Of course, agreed Thomas. He now felt sorry for Bertie and promised to get help at the next station. Thomas set off again. Already he felt much more cheerful and Bertie's passengers, traveling in Annie and Clarabel, all reached home safely. When Bertie was better, he came to thank Thomas. I'm sorry I teased you about being late. That's all right, replied Thomas. I'm glad I could help. There are times when being late isn't such a bad thing after all. With a last cheerful greeting, the two friends went back to work. More and more people travelled on the Fat Controllers Railway. Everyone had to work very hard indeed. The trucks complained bitterly. But then trucks always do, when no one takes much notice. Dirty trucks, dirty sidings, ugh, grumbled James. That is enough, ordered a well-known voice. Let me tell you that an engine for goods work will arrive from Scotland tomorrow. The Fat Controller stared. Did you say two engines, Inspector? Yes, sir. 
incendiary other back at once. Quite so, sir. But the two engines are exactly alike, sir, and have no numbers. They say they lost them on the way. The fat controller seized his hat. We'll soon settle that nonsense, he said grimly. The two engines greeted him cheerfully. Now then, I hear you've lost your numbers. How did that happen? The mourner slowly slipped it off, sir. You can who it is. The fat controller pondered. What are your names? Donald and Dougie, sir. Good, he said. Then your controller can tell me which of you is which. Oh, he, he didn't kin our names, sir. We only given ourselves names when we lost our numbers. One of you, said the fat controller, is playing truant. I shall find him out and send him home. Inspector, he ordered, give these engines numbers and set them to work. Soon workmen came to give the twins their numbers. Donald was nine and Douglas ten. No nine and ten, smiled the inspector. Here's Duck. He'll show you round before you start work. The twins enjoyed themselves and were soon friends with Duck. They didn't mind what they did. They tackled goods trains and coaches easily. We like it fine here. That's good, smiled Duck, but take my tip. Watch out for Gordon, Henry and James. They're sure to try some nonsense. Did a fash yourself, chuckled Douglas. We'll soon settle them. Donald and Douglas had deep-toned whistles. They sound like buses, said Gordon. Or ships, sniggered Henry. Tugboat Annie, laughed Gordon. Ha, ha, ha. You wouldn't be making fun of us, would you now? Asked Donald. Gordon and Henry jumped. Uh, no, said Gordon. No, 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 certainly not, said Henry. That's fine, said Douglas. No, just mind the both of you and keep it that way. That was the way Gordon and Henry kept it. Every day, punctually at 3.30, Gordon steams in with the express, with a special coach for passengers travelling to places on Thomas's branch line. Thomas is very proud of his special coach. One afternoon, Douglas helped Duck in the yard, while Donald waited to take a good train to the other end of the line. As Duck was busy arranging Donald's trucks, Douglas offered to take away Gordon's coaches. Douglas was enjoying himself, when an awful thought struck him. I hope the fat controller doesn't have find out I shouldn't have been here. I couldn't abide going back. He worried so much over this that he forgot about Thomas's special coach. He pushed it with the others into the carriage siding, then ambled along to join Donald. Soon Thomas came fussing. Where's my coach? Coach? asked Donald. What coach? My special coach that Gordon brings for me. It's gone. I must find it. He bustled away. Oh, sick, said Douglas. A mourner stowed the special coach with the others. A mob of angry passengers erupted from the siding. Now listen, said Douglas's driver. We'll change tenders. Quick now, do as I say. Donald, with Douglas's tender, number 10, was out and away with the goods before they came near, while Douglas and his driver waited with innocent expressions. Ah, said the fat controller, number nine. And why have you not taken the goods? May a tender is a wire, sir. Hmm, ah, said the fat controller. I see. He turned to the passengers. The matter will be investigated. Please accept my apologies. The fat controller watched them till they climbed the station ramp. He swung round suddenly. Douglas, he rapped. Why are you masquerading with Donald's tender? Donald and Douglas are twins and had arrived from Scotland to help Sir Topham Hatt, but only one engine had been expected. The twins meant well, but did cause confusion. Sir Topham Hatt had given them numbers, Donald 9 and Douglas 10, but he was still planning to send one engine home. There was a brake van in the yard that had taken a dislike to Douglas. 
Things always went wrong when he had to take it out. His trains were late and he was blamed. Douglas began to worry. Donald, his twin, was angry. You're a muckle nuisance, said Donald. It's to leave you behind I be wanting. You can't, said the brake van. I'm essential. Ah, are you, Donald burst out. You're nothing but a screeching and a noise when all's said and done. Spite doggy, would you? Take that. Oh, oh, cried the van. There's more coming should you misbehave. The van behaved better after that. Until one day, Donald had an accident. The rails were slippery. He couldn't stop in time. Donald wasn't hurt, but Sir Topham Hatt was most annoyed. I am disappointed, Donald. I didn't expect such mm, clumsiness from you. I had decided to send Douglas back and keep you. I'm sorry, sir, said Donald. I should think so, too. You have upset my arrangements. Now James will have to help with the goods work while you have your tender mended. James won't like that. Sir Topham Hatt was right. James grumbled dreadfully about extra work. Anyone would think, said Douglas, that Donald had had his accident on purpose. I hear tell about an engine and some tar wagons. Shut up, said James. It's not funny. He didn't like to be reminded of his own accident. Well, well, well. Surely, James, it wasn't you. You didn't say. James didn't say. He slouched sulkily away. James is cross, snickered the spiteful brake van. We'll try to make him crosser still. Hold back, giggled the freight cars to each other. James did his best, but he was exhausted when they reached Edward's station. Luckily, Douglas was there. Help me up the hill, please, panted James. These freight cars are playing tricks. We'll show them, said Douglas. Slowly but surely, the snorting engines forced the freight cars up the hill. But James was losing steam. I can't do it! I can't do it! Leave it to me, shouted Douglas. The conductor was anxious. Go steady! The van's breaking! The van was in pieces. No one had been hurt, and soon Edward came to clear the mess. Sir Topham Hatt was on board. I might have known it would be Douglas, he said. Douglas was grand, sir, said Edward. James had no steam left, but Douglas worked hard enough for three. I heard him from my yard. Two would have been enough, said Sir Topham Hatt. I want to be fair, Douglas, but I don't know. I really don't know. Sir Topham Hatt was making up his mind about which engine to send away. But that's another story. Snow came early to the island of Sodor. It was heavier than usual. Most engines hate snow. Donald and Douglas were used to it. Coupled back to back with a van between their tenders and a snowplow on their fronts, they set to work. They puffed backwards and forwards patrolling the line.
Generally, the snow slipped away easily, but sometimes they found deeper drifts. Presently, they came to a drift which was larger than most. They charged it and were just backing for another try when... Help! Help! Lord six, Donald! It's Henry! Don't worry yourself, Henry. Wait a while. We'll have you out. Henry was very grateful. He saw all was not well. The twins were looking glum. They told him Sir Topham Hatt was making a decision. He'll send us away for sure. It's a shame, said Percy. A lot of nonsense about a broken signal box, grumbled Gordon. That spiteful brake van, too, put in James. Good riddance, that's what I say. The twins were splendid in the snow, added Henry. It isn't fair. They all agreed that something must be done, but none knew what. Percy decided to talk to Edward about it. What you need, said Edward, is a deputation. He explained what that was. Percy ran back quickly. Edward says we need a, a depot station. Of course, said Gordon. The question is, what is a desperation? Asked Henry. It's when engines tell Sir Topham Hatt something's wrong, said Percy. Did you say tell Sir Topham Hatt? Asked Duck thoughtfully. There was a long silence. I propose, said Gordon, that Percy be our uh, disputation. Me? squeaked Percy. I can't. Rubbish, Percy, said Henry. It's easy. That's settled then, said Gordon. Poor Percy wished it wasn't. Hello, Percy. It's nice to be back. Percy jumped. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. You look nervous, Percy. What's the matter? Please, sir, uh, they've, they've made me a desperation, sir, uh, to, sp to speak to you, sir. I, I don't like it, sir. Sir Topham Hatt pondered. Do you mean a deputation, Percy? Yes, sir, please, sir. Uh, it's Donald and Douglas. They say, sir, that if you send them away, sir, w well, they'll be turned into scrap, sir. That would be dreadful, sir. Uh, please, sir, don't send them away. Thank you, Percy. That will do. Later, Sir Topham Hatt spoke to the engines. I had a, a deputation. I understand your feelings, and I've given a lot of thought to the matter. He paused impressively. Donald and Douglas, I hear that your work in the snow was good. You shall have a new coat of paint. The twins were surprised. Thank ye, sir. But your names will be painted on you. We'll have no more mistakes. Thank ye, sir. Uh, d does this mean that the both of us... Sir Topham Hatt smiled. It means... But the rest of his speech was drowned in a delighted chorus of cheers and whistles. The twins were here to stay. Thomas the tank engine has worked his branch line for many years and knows it very well. Know just where to stop, Thomas," laughed his driver. "You could almost manage it without me." 
Thomas had become conceited, he didn't realize his driver was joking. Later, he boasted to the others. Driver says I don't need him now. Don't be so daft, snorted Percy. I'd never go without my driver, said Toby earnestly. I'd be frightened. Puh, boasted Thomas. I'm not scared. You'd never dare. I would then. You'll see. The next morning, the firelighter came. Thomas drowsed comfortably as the warmth spread through his boiler. Percy and Toby were still asleep. Thomas suddenly remembered. Silly stick in the muds, he chuckled. I'll show them. Driver said I could manage without him. I'll just go out and then I'll stop and weesh. That'll make them jump. Thomas thought he was being clever, but really he was only moving because a careless cleaner had meddled with his controls. He soon found his mistake. He tried to weesh, but he couldn't. He tried to stop, but he couldn't. He just kept rolling along. He didn't dare look at what was coming next. There was the station master's house. The station master was about to have breakfast. Horrors, cried Thomas, and shut his eyes. The house rocked, broken glass tinkled, plaster was everywhere. Thomas had collected a bush on his travels. He peered into the room through its leaves. He couldn't speak. The station master was furious. His wife picked up her plate. You miserable engine, she scolded. Just look what you've done to our breakfast. Now I shall have to cook some more. She banged the door. More plaster fell. This time it fell on Thomas. Thomas felt depressed. Workmen propped up the house with strong poles and laid rails through the garden. Then the Scottish twin engines Donald and Douglas arrived. Dinner fash yourself, Thomas. We'll soon have you back on the rails, they laughed. Donald and Douglas, puffing hard, managed to haul Thomas back to safety. Bits of fencing, the bush, and a broken window frame festooned his front, which was badly twisted. The twins laughed and left him. Thomas was in disgrace. There was worse to come. You're in a lot of trouble, Thomas. I know, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Thomas's voice was muffled behind his bush. You must go to the works and have your front mended. It will be a long job. Yes, sir. Meanwhile, a diesel rail car will do your work. A, 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 a diesel, sir? Thomas spluttered. Yes, Thomas. Diesels always stay in their sheds till they are wanted. Diesels never gallivant off to breakfast in station masters' houses. Percy and Toby were worried. Thomas's recent accident had caused a great deal of trouble, and Sir Topham Hatt was waiting for them with important news. Here is Daisy, the diesel rail car, who has come to help while Thomas is indisposed. Please, sir, will she go when Thomas comes back, sir? That depends, said Sir Topham Hatt. Meanwhile, however long she stays, I hope you will both make her welcome and comfortable. 
Yes, sir. We'll try, sir, said the engines. Good. Run along now and show her the shed. She will want to rest after her journey. Daisy was not easy to please. She shuddered at the engine shed. This is dreadfully smelly. I'm highly sprung, and anything smelly is bad for my swerves. Next, they tried the carriage shed. This is better, said Daisy, but whatever is that rubbish? The rubbish turned out to be Annie, Clarabelle, and Henrietta, who were most offended. We won't stay here to be insulted, they fumed. Percy and Toby had to take them away and spend half the night soothing their hurt feelings. The engines woke next morning feeling exhausted. Daisy, on the other hand, felt bright and cheerful. Woo -woo, woo -woo. She tooted as she came out of the yard and back to the station. Look at me, she purred to the passengers. I'm the latest diesel, highly sprung and right up to date. You won't want Thomas's bumpy old Annie and Clarabelle now. The passengers waited for Daisy to start, but she didn't. She saw that a milk van was about to be coupled to her and was most indignant. Do they expect me to pull that? Surely, said her driver, you can pull one van. I won't, said Daisy. Percy can do it. He loves messing about with freight cars. She began to shudder violently. Nonsense, said her driver. Come on now, back down. Daisy lurched backwards. She was so cross that she blew a fuse. Told you, she said and stopped. Everyone argued with her, but it was no use. It's fitter's orders, she said. What is? My fitter's a very nice man. He comes every week and examines me carefully. Daisy, he says, never, never pull. You're highly sprung, and pulling is bad for your swerves. So that's how it is, finished Daisy. Stuff and nonsense, said the station master. I can't understand, said the shunter. Whatever made Sir Topham Hatt send us such a feeble... Feeble, feeble, spluttered Daisy. Let me stop arguing, grumbled the passengers. We're late already. So they uncoupled the van, and Daisy purred away, feeling very pleased with herself. She could now enjoy her journey. That's a good story, she chuckled. I'll do just what work I choose and no more. But she said it to herself. Daisy, the diesel rail car's work in the countryside was full of surprises, but she was frightened of bulls and cows, and she remained very lazy and stubborn. One day, Toby brought Henrietta to the station where Percy was grumpily shunting. Hello, Percy. I see Daisy's left the milk behind again. I'll have to make a special journey with it, I suppose. Anyone would think I'd nothing to do, grumbled Percy. Tell you what, replied Toby, I'll take the milk, you fetch my freight cars. The drivers and station master agreed.
Percy had never been to the quarry before. He began ordering the freight cars about. Hurry along, he said. The freight cars grumbled to each other. This is Toby's place. Percy's got no right to poke his funnel up here and push us around. They whispered and passed the word. Pay Percy back. Pay Percy back. Come along, puffed Percy. No nonsense. We'll give him nonsense, giggled the freight cars. But they followed so quietly that Percy thought they were under control. Suddenly, they saw a notice ahead. All trains stopped to pin down brakes. Beep, beep! Brakes, conductor, please! But before he could check them, the freight car surged ahead. On, on, they cried. Help, help, whistled Percy. The man on duty at the crossing rushed to warn traffic with his red flag, but was too late to switch Percy to the runaway siding. Frantically trying to grip the rails, Percy slid into the yard. Beep! Beep! Look out! The brake van was in smithereens. Percy's driver and fireman had jumped clear, but Percy was stranded. Next day, Sir Topham Hatt arrived. Toby and Daisy had helped to clear the wreckage, but Percy remained on his perch of freight cars. We must now try, said Sir Topham Hatt, to run the branch line with Toby and a diesel. You have put us in an awkward predicament, Percy. I am sorry, sir. You must stay there till we are ready, continued Sir Topham Hatt. And you really must be more careful with freight cars. Percy sighed. The freight cars groaned beneath his wheels. He quite understood about awkward predicaments. Sir Topham Hatt spoke severely to Daisy, too. My engines work hard. I send lazy engines away. Daisy was ashamed. However, Toby says you worked hard after Percy's accident. So you shall have another chance. Thank you, sir, said Daisy. I will work hard. Toby says he'll help me. Excellent. What Toby doesn't know about branch line problems isn't worth knowing. Our Toby's an experienced engine. Next day, Thomas came back. And Percy was sent to be mended. Annie and Clarabelle were delighted to see Thomas again, and he took them for a run at once. All are now friends, and Toby has taught Daisy a great deal. She shooed a cow off the line the other day all by herself. That shows you, doesn't it? Bill and Ben are tank engine twins. Each has four wheels, a tiny chimney and dome, and a small squat cab. Their freight cars are filled with china clay. It is needed for pottery, paper, paint, and many other things. The twins are now kept busy pulling the cars for engines on the main line and for ships in the harbor. One morning, they arranged some cars and went away for more. They 
returned to find them all gone. The twins were most surprised. Their drivers examined a patch of oil. That's diesel, they said. It's a waddle? asked Bill. A diseasel, I think, replied Ben. There's a notice about them in our shed. Coughs and sneezels spread diseasels. You had a cough in your smoke box yesterday. It's your fault the diseasel came. It isn't. It is. Stop arguing, you two, laughed their drivers. Let's go and rescue our freight cars. Bill and Ben were horrified. But the diseasel will magic us away like the freight cars. He won't magic us, replied their drivers. We'll more likely magic him. Listen, he doesn't know your twins, so we'll take away your names and numbers, and then this is what we'll do. Puffing hard, the twins set off on their journey to find the diesel. They were looking forward to playing tricks on him. Creeping into the yard, they found the diesel on a siding with the missing cars. Ben hid behind, but Bill went boldly alongside. The diesel looked up. Do you mind? Yes, said Bill. I do. I want my cars back. These are mine said the diesel. Go away. Bill pretended to be frightened. You're a big bully, he whimpered. You'll be sorry. He ran back and hid behind the cars on the other side. Ben now came forward. Car stealer, hissed Ben. He ran away too. Bill took his place. This went on and on till the diesel's eyes nearly popped out. Stop, you're making me giddy. The two engines gazed at him. Are there two of you? Yes, we're twins. I might have known it. Just then, Edward bustled up. Bill and Ben, why are you playing here? We're not playing, protested Bill. We're rescuing our cars, squeaked Ben. Even you don't take our cars without asking, but this diseasel did. There's no cause to be rude, said Edward severely. This engine is a Metropolitan Vickers Diesel Electric Type 2. The twins were most impressed. We're sorry, Mr. Er. Never mind, the diesel smiled. Call me Boko. I'm sorry I didn't understand about the cars. That's all right, then, said Edward. Now off you go, Bill and Ben. Fetch Poco's cars, then you take this lot. There's no real harm in them, he said to Boko, but they're maddening at times. Boko chuckled. Maddening, he said, is the word. Thomas's branch line is important and so is Edward's. But their track and bridges are not so strong as those on the main line. So Topham Hat does not allow the heavier main line engines like Gordon to run on them. But one day, the way Gordon was talking, you would have thought Sir Topham Hat had given this order for quite another reason. It's not fair, grumbled Gordon. What isn't fair, asked Edward. Letting branch line diesels pull main line trains. Never mind, Gordon. I'm sure Boko will let you pull his freight cars sometimes. Gordon spluttered. 
I won't pull Boko's dirty cars. I won't run on branch lines. Why not? It would be a nice change. Sir Topham Hatt would never approve, huffed Gordon. Branch lines are vulgar. Gordon puffed away. Edward chuckled and followed him to the station. Every evening, the two engines pull two fast trains from the station. Gordon always leaves first with an express for the main line. Edward follows five minutes later with his train for the branch line. Usually, everything runs like clockwork, but tonight there was trouble. A lady in a green floppy hat was saying goodbye to a friend. It was nearly time for Gordon to start. The fireman looked back towards the conductor's van and saw something green waving. Right away, mate. He thought the conductor had waved his flag. Gordon started, leaving luggage, his passengers, and the conductor all standing on the platform. Everyone was very surprised and cross. To make matters worse, by the time Gordon had been stopped and brought back, Edward was already late with his train. So now he set off first. But the signalman at the junction wasn't told about the change. By mistake, he sent Edward along the main line. Gordon was sent along the branch and arrived cold and cross on one of the sidings near the harbor. Next morning, Bill and Ben peeped into the yard. There were no cars for them, but they didn't mind that. Teasing Gordon would be much better fun. What's that? asked Bill. Shh, whispered Ben. It's Gordon. It looks like Gordon. But it can't be. Gordon never comes on the branch lines. He thinks them vulgar. Gordon pretended he hadn't heard them. If it isn't Gordon, said Ben, it's just a pile of old iron, which we'd better take to the scrapyard. No, Bill, this lot's useless for scrap. We'll take it to the harbor and dump it in the sea. Gordon was alarmed. I am Gordon. Stop, stop. When Boko suddenly arrived, Gordon thought him the most beautiful sight he had ever seen. Boko, my dear engine, save me! Boko quickly sized up the situation and threatened to take away the cars he had brought for Bill and Ben. This made the twins behave at once. Gordon thought Boko was wonderful. Those little demons, how do you do it? Ah, well, said Boko, it's just a knack. Gordon still believes that Boko saved his life, but we know the twins were only teasing, don't we? Bertie the bus was giving some visitors a tour of the island of Soda. It was their last afternoon, and Edward was preparing to take them to meet Bill and Ben. He found it hard to start the heavy train. Did you see him straining? asked Henry. Positively painful, remarked James. Just pathetic, grunted Gordon. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. Shut up, burst out Duck. You're all jealous. Edward's better than any of you. You're right, Duck, said Boko. 
Edward's old, but he'll surprise us all. I've done it. We're off. I've done it. We're off, said Edward, as he finally puffed out of the station. Bill and Ben were delighted to see the visitors. They loved being photographed. Later, they took the party to the China Clay Works in a brake van special. Everyone had a splendid time, and the visitors were most impressed. Then Edward took the visitors home. On the way, the weather changed. Wind and rain buffeted Edward. His sanding gear failed, and his fireman rode in front, dropping sand on the rails by hand. Suddenly, Edward's wheels slipped fiercely, and with a shrieking crack, something broke. The crew inspected the damage. Repairs took some time. One of your crank pins broke, Edward, said his driver. We've taken your side rods off. Now you're like an old-fashioned engine. Can you get these people home? They must start back tonight. I'll try, sir, promised Edward. Edward puffed and pulled his hardest, but his wheels kept slipping and he could not start the heavy train. The passengers were anxious. The driver, fireman, and conductor went along the train, making adjustments between the coaches. We've loosened the couplings, Edward. Now you can pick up your coaches one by one, just as you do with freight cars. That'll be much easier, said Edward. Come on, he puffed and moved cautiously forward. The first coach moving helped to start the second, and the second helped the third. I've done it! I've done it! puffed Edward. Steady, boy, warned his driver. Well done, boy! You've got them! You've got them! And he listened happily to Edward's steady beat as he forged slowly but surely ahead. At last, battered, weary, but unbeaten, Edward steamed in. Henry was waiting for the visitors with the special train. Beep! Beep! Sir Topham Hatt angrily pointed to the clock, but excited passengers cheered and thanked Edward, his driver and fireman. Duck and Boko saw to it that Edward was left in peace. Gordon and James remained respectfully silent. Accident, it runs again as a warning to others, plunging into the gap, shrieking like a lost soul. Percy, what are you talking about? The ghost train. Driver saw it last night. Where? Asked Thomas and Toby. He didn't say. Oh, it makes my wheels wobble to think of it. Puh, said Thomas. You're just a silly little engine. I'm not scared.
Thomas didn't believe in your ghost, said Percy next morning. His driver laughed. Neither do I. It was only a pretend ghost story. Percy was disappointed. That evening, he came back from the harbor. Percy knew where he was, even in the dark. Crow's Farm Crossing. We shan't be long now. He liked running at night. The rails hummed and the signal light shone green. But a broken cartload of lime lay ahead. Sam the farmer had just gone for help. Percy broke the cart to smithereens. Lime flew everywhere. He puffed quickly to the nearest signal box. Percy's driver explained what had happened. I'll see to it, said the signalman. But you'd better clean Percy, or people will think he's a ghost. Percy chuckled. Do let's pretend I'm a ghost and scare Thomas. That'll teach him to say I'm a silly little engine. Toby promised to help. Thomas was being oiled up for his evening train. Percy's had an accident, cried Toby. Poor engine, said Thomas. Botheration, that means I'll be late. They've cleared the line for you, but there's something worse. Out with it, Toby. I can't wait all evening. I've just seen something, said Toby. It, it, lo it looked like Percy's ghost. It, 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 it said it w w was com coming he here to w warn us. Puh, who cares? Don't be frightened, Toby. I'll take care of you. Percy. No, no, not by the smoke on my chimney, chim, chim. I'll chuff and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. Oh dear, exclaimed Thomas. It's getting late. Oh, oh, I'd no idea. Oh, I, I must find Annie and Clarabelle. It was morning when Thomas returned. Where have you been? asked Toby. Ah, uh, well, said Thomas, I, I knew you'd be sad about Percy, and I, uh, I, I didn't like to intrude. I, I slept in the freight shed and... Oh, sorry, can't stop. Gotta see a coach about a train. Percy was none the worse for his adventure and was still enjoying himself enormously. He had heard everything. Well, 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 what do you know about that? Anyone would think, chuckled Toby, that our Thomas had just seen a ghost. In the summer, the work crews cut the long grass along the tracks, raking it into heaps to dry in the sun. At this time of year, Percy stops where they have been cutting. The men load up his empty wagons and he pulls them to the station. Toby then takes them to the hills for the farmers to feed their stock.
Percy gave a ghostly whistle. Don't be frightened, Thomas, he laughed. It's only me. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone, said Thomas. You're like ugly indeed. I'm green caterpillar with red stripes, continued Thomas firmly. You crawl like one, too. I don't. Who's been late every afternoon this week? It's the hay. I can't help that, said Thomas. Time's time, and Sir Topham Hatt relies on me to keep it. I can't if you crawl in the hay till all hours. Green caterpillar indeed, fumed Percy, as he set off to collect some hay to take to the harbor. Everyone says I'm handsome, or at least nearly everyone. Anyway, my curves are better than Thomas's corners. Thomas says I'm always late, he grumbled. I'm never late, or at least only a few minutes. What's that to Thomas? He can always catch up time further on. All the same, he and his driver decided to start home early. Then came trouble. A crate of treacle was upset all over Percy. Percy was cross. He was still sticky when he puffed away. The wind was blowing fiercely. Look at that, exclaimed the driver. The wind caught the piled hay, tossing it up and over the track. The line climbed here. Take a run at it, Percy, his driver advised. Percy gathered speed, but the hay made the rails slippery and his wheels wouldn't grip. Time after time, he stalled with spinning wheels and had to wait till the line ahead was cleared before he could start again. Everyone was waiting. Thomas seethed impatiently. Ten minutes late. I warned him. Passengers will complain. And Sir Topham Hatt. Then they all saw Percy. They laughed and shouted. Sorry I'm late, Percy panted. Look what's crawled out of the hay, teased Thomas. What's wrong, asked Percy. Talk about hairy caterpillars, puffed Thomas. It's worth being late to have seen you. When Percy got home, his driver showed him what he looked like in a mirror. Bust my buffers. No wonder they all laughed. I'm just like a woolly bear. Please clean me before Toby comes. But it was no good. Thomas told Toby all about it. Instead of talking about sensible things like playing ghosts, Thomas and Toby made jokes about woolly bear caterpillars and other creatures which crawl about in hay. They laughed a lot, but Percy thought they were really being very silly indeed. It was Christmas on the island of Sodor. All the engines were working hard. Thomas and Toby were busy carrying people and parcels up and down the branch line. Everyone was happy. Only the coaches, Annie and Claribel, were complaining. It's always the same before Christmas, they groaned. We feel so full. We feel so full. Oh, come on, said Thomas. Where's your festive spirit? Christmas Day is almost here. By the side of the track was a little cottage with a familiar figure waving to them. It's Mrs. Kindly, whistled Thomas. Beep, beep, happy Christmas. Thomas always felt better for seeing her. Christmas just wouldn't be Christmas without Mrs. Kindly, he said to himself. 
When work was over, Thomas went to see the other engines. All their coats had been polished. Huh, said Gordon. Just look at us. Your driver will have to work fast to get you as smart as us. Never mind that, replied Thomas. I have something important to say. Do you realize it's been a whole year since Mrs. Kindly saved us from a nasty accident? You remember when she was ill in bed and... Yes, of course, interrupted Edward. You told us how she waved her red dressing gown out of her window to warn you about a landslide ahead. And you and Toby gave her presents, Percy joined in, and Sir Topham Hatt sent her to the seaside to get better. But, said the other engines, the rest of us never thanked her properly. Exactly, said Thomas. So now I think we should all give her a special Christmas party. Everyone was getting very excited, and the drivers felt sure that Sir Topham Hatt would agree, as indeed he did. The engines were all busy making plans when silence fell. Sir Topham Hatt had bad news. The weather's changed badly. Mrs. Kindly is snowed up. Toby says he'll help to rescue her. You must help too, Thomas. There's no party unless you do. Thomas hated snow, but he said bravely, I'll try, sir. We must rescue her. We must. There's a good engine. You and Toby will manage splendidly. Thomas charged the snow drifts fiercely. Sometimes he swept them aside. Sometimes they stuck fast. And the men had to loosen them. But at the cutting near the cottage, they could go no further. Look at that, exclaimed Thomas's fireman. Beep, beep, here we are. An answering wave came from an upstairs window. Then they heard a familiar sound. That's Terence, the tractor, said Thomas. He's come to help too. Sure enough, Terence had a snowplow and was working hard to clear a patch to the railroad line and safety. At long last, the rescue was complete. Percy took the tired workman home. Terence said goodbye to Mrs. Kindly and promised to take care of her cottage as he watched them all set off. The engines made good time. No more snow had fallen, but the yard was dark. There was no one to be seen. Thomas's heart sank. Suddenly, all the lights went on. What a marvelous sight awaited Mrs. Kindly. Well done, said Sir Topham Hatt. I'm really proud of you all. Mrs. Kindly especially thanked the smaller engines. Thomas and Toby are old friends, she said. And now, Percy, you are my friend too. Percy was very pleased. Three cheers for Mrs. Kindly, he called. Beep, beep, beep. They all whistled. We wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thomas the Tank Engine and his friends thought it was the best Christmas ever, and Mrs. Kindly could think of nowhere she would rather live than here, with them on the island of Sodor.